And here's the thing. We're in the complexity of the 21st century, and we need solutions to solve all these problems that we have. We need the designers, the entrepreneurs, we need the innovators and the creators to be the out-of-the-box thinkers to take us from where we are today to where we're going to go. And they need these flashes of insight and these moments of brilliance and genius, because if not, we're in trouble. The world is going to be in such a weird, scary place that if we don't have this, if we're unable to do it, I'm scared of what's going to happen to my children. And so think of the post-it story. We don't think of post-it as the most innovative thing, but it was in a moment of brilliance that the post-it was created. The gentleman who created the post-it worked for 3M and created this sort of weak sticky glue, but didn't know what to do with it because it didn't fit what he was doing. And then in church, he needed this paper to stick on his Bible, and he was like, oh, that glue could go there. Flash of insight. And that's how the post-it was created. But I actually have a really, really big problem with that story, is that I think it's a lie. And I think what it does is the assumption is that creativity and brilliance and innovation is something innate. And so either you have it or you're SOL. And if you have it, wonderful. And if you're like the rest of us, what are we going to do? And I actually want to shift our thinking a little bit to say, what if creativity and innovation was not an innate trait, but a learned skill? What if we can learn to be creative, like we can learn to dance, and we can learn excellence in other fields? Why, not, why can't we learn excellence in creativity and new ways? And that's actually what I spend my time doing. I work on a really neat initiative at the Rotman School Management called I Think. And we're working with teachers right now in the GTA to think about how can we teach this to our students? How does learning how to be creative become accessible to all? And we've had some beautiful, beautiful examples of students starting to show that this is actually possible. And I want to tell you one story. We have a grade 12 course at a high school in Toronto and what we teach is called integrative thinking. And what they did is they had a challenge they were given, this group of five students, at the end of a semester course, 30% of the mark was based on this. And what happened was, is their culminating was this group of five students got paired with the teacher committee. They got paired with the equity committee. And the equity committee said, we have a problem with homophobia at our school. We know it's a challenge, and we're starting to think of ways to solve it. Can you join our team and help us do that? And I want to, before I tell you what the students did, I want to take a moment and say, what ha what's been happening in other schools? In most schools, you have posters that are being put up, speakers being brought in, a gay straight alliance is coming, which are all wonderful and helpful and matter to the students in that school. But what our students did was just a little bit different and took it just one step further. And they actually went to their teachers and they said, you're climbing the wrong mountain. You're asking the wrong question. Because of the work that we've done, homophobia is actually a symptom of something much more dangerous in this school. Homophobia is the symptoms of students not sharing with each other and not feeling comfortable sharing with each other. And then the students embarked on solving that problem, and they did it by, with three things. The first one is, is part of the things that we teach is about how do you dig into your model? How do you dig into your understanding of the world? And we ask that by challenging, understanding our assumptions, understanding when our assumptions hold true, but also when do they break down. And when they break down, can we dig in there and try to understand more and more information? The second thing that they did is part of our work is around opposing models. So we look at what are solutions to the problem that we currently look at and what is the value in that. So students said usually when there's a challenge, we look at assemblies or we do in the classroom work. And they listed all the benefits and started pinpointing things in each of the models that they really liked. Then the third thing that they had was time. This is a project that they have over a month to do, plus Christmas break. So it's actually about six weeks that they sit with this. And what time does is it allows them to be, let me understand homophobia. Wait, it's the wrong question. Let me go back and start again. Because in what other assignment do you get to tell your teacher, uh-uh, wrong question, I need to do this again and give me more time. The second thing is they actually had to present their, their thought process and their solution three different times to three different audience. And I saw their first one and their last one, and it was amazing how refined their presentations got, how clearly they communicated what their process was. And so I just want to take a moment to pause and say, let's take stock of what these students did. They were put in an environment where their teachers trusted them to solve a problem, and where they could say to their teachers, you asked me the wrong question. 
Let us solve the real problem here. Let us create a solution that matters. And so what I actually want to tell you is what we don't, we don't need out of the box thinking. Creativity isn't magic. Rather, we need deep, deep in the box thinking. We need education to become this place of rigor, where you're expected not just to know the four causes of World War I, but how they affect and influence each other. Whose perspectives are they from? Whose voice are we not hearing? And when we do that, we identify the pinpoints in the model that allow us to connect in such new ways that we get to be creative. And imagine the education system where rigor is paired with imagination and creativity and an explosion of both of them happening in classrooms across this country and heck, in my world, across the world. And I want to just bring it back to Steve Jobs and Apple, who I've heard being described as a genius all the time. What he did, actually, I would argue, is they had a really good overview of Apple. And he knew what was happening, and what he was great at is looking at different departments and thinking, what if these two happened? What is possible? And so I want to imagine with you this education system where we do two things with students, where we equip them to be passionately curious, where they want to dig into things, they want the rigor, they want the deep understanding, and then we create optimistic learners out of them because they have the tools and a foundation to actually create and be hopeful in the world. And if I could be a part of creating that, if my role at the work that I do now and the work I continue to do in the future creates an education system where students aren't just told, you can do it, but here are their tools, our world will be a much happier place, and I think that would be a life worth living. Thank you. Okay.